Ever wondered how chemists build complex molecules from scratch? Well, they use a strategy called retrosynthesis. This is a method used in organic chemistry to design a synthesis route by working backwards from the target molecule. Imagine it like solving a maze but starting from the end and working your way to the beginning. Retrosynthesis is the cornerstone of organic synthesis, providing a logical step-by-step -step method to design complex organic reactions. It's like the master blueprint that guides chemists in creating everything from life-saving drugs to advanced materials. In the world of retrosynthesis, we use a unique language filled with terms like synthon, retron, and disconnect. These terms help us break down complex molecules into simpler building blocks. Now that we have a basic understanding of retrosynthesis, let's dive deeper into its core principles. And remember, in the realm of chemistry, knowing the end product often leads to the best beginning. In the world of retrosynthesis, certain terms are essential to understand its mechanics. Let's dive in and unravel what they mean. First we have synthon. It's like a puzzle piece in the grand scheme of a chemical reaction. Think of it as an idealized fragment, a part of a molecule that we use to visualize the steps needed to build our target molecule. It's like having a blueprint of a Lego structure, and synthons are the individual Lego blocks. Next, we encounter synthetic equivalent. This term refers to the real-world chemical compound that we use in place of a synthon in actual laboratory synthesis. To stick with our Lego analogy, if synthons are the blueprint, synthetic equivalents are the physical Lego pieces you use to build your structure. Then we have functional group interconversion, or FGI for short. This is the process of transforming one functional group into another. Imagine it as changing a Lego block's color or shape to fit perfectly into your structure. It's a handy tool that gives us flexibility in our building process. Lastly, we delve into the concept of disconnection. This is where we break our target molecule into smaller, more manageable pieces or synthons. It's like viewing an assembled Lego structure and deciding where to split it to understand how it was built. Each of these terms is a vital cog in the machinery of retrosynthesis. Synthons and synthetic equivalents help us visualize and build our target molecule. Functional group interconversion allows us to modify and adapt our building blocks as needed. And disconnection guides us in deconstructing our target molecule into simpler parts. With these terms in our toolbox, we can start to dissect the process of retrosynthesis. Retrosynthesis isn't a random process, there are rules and guidelines to follow. Just like a master chef follows a recipe, chemists use a set of instructions when dissecting complex molecules. These rules and guidelines illuminate the path to successful retrosynthesis. Firstly, strategic bond disconnection plays a pivotal role. This is the practice of breaking bonds in a molecule to yield simpler fragments. The trick here is to identify which bonds to break. Chemists often look for bonds that, when disconnected, will yield the most stable fragments. This stability can be based on several factors, including the presence of resonant structures or aromatic rings. It's a bit like trying to disassemble a complex Lego structure. You want to break it down in a way that leaves you with the most useful pieces. Secondly, chemists prefer to simplify complex molecules into simpler fragments. Simplification is the heart of retrosynthesis. By breaking down a complex structure into its simpler constituents, we can better understand how it was assembled in the first place. It's akin to solving a jigsaw puzzle by grouping similar pieces together. Thirdly, the choice of reagents and reaction conditions is crucial. Different reagents and conditions can steer the reaction in different directions, influencing the final product. The correct choice can be the difference between success and failure, like choosing the right ingredients can make or break a culinary masterpiece. Lastly, chemists always consider the synthetic feasibility of the proposed route. It's not enough to merely propose a route. It must be practically achievable in the laboratory. This involves considering factors such as the availability of starting materials, the cost of reagents, and the safety of the process. It's like planning a road trip. You need to make sure the route is practical, affordable, and safe. These rules guide chemists in dissecting complex molecules, but what happens when we have more than one functional group? This question leads us to the exciting world of disconnections involving multiple functional groups. But that's a topic for the next segment. When dealing with a molecule that has one functional group, the disconnection approach becomes straightforward. As we delve deeper into the world of retrosynthesis, let's picture a molecule with a single functional group. This solitary group is the star of the show, the focal point of our disconnection strategy. 
But how exactly does this work? Imagine you're at a crossroads. One path leads you to the functional group and the other leads to the rest of the molecule. That's what we're doing here. We're at a crossroads and we're choosing the path that leads to the functional group. Now, when we disconnect, we aim to break a bond that leads to the creation of two simpler molecules. These simpler molecules are easier to prepare in the lab, which is the ultimate goal of retrosynthesis. For example, consider a molecule with an ester functional group. When we disconnect at the ester, we find ourselves with two new molecules, a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. These are much simpler to synthesize than the original ester. And voila, we have successfully carried out a disconnection involving one functional group. But why do we choose to disconnect at the functional group? The answer lies in the reactivity of these groups. Functional groups are the most reactive part of a molecule, and this reactivity can be harnessed in synthesis. By disconnecting at the functional group, we can break down complex molecules into simpler, more manageable pieces. But remember, not all functional groups are created equal. Some groups are more reactive than others, and the choice of where to disconnect will depend on the specific group present in the molecule. It's a bit like a puzzle, piecing together the best way to disconnect a molecule to achieve the simplest synthesis. That's how we handle one functional group, but things get more interesting when we have two. Scene script. Juggling two functional groups in a molecule? No sweat, retrosynthesis has a solution. When we're dealing with disconnections involving two functional groups, it's like playing a high-stakes game of chess. Each move needs to be calculated, each decision meticulously made. But don't worry, retrosynthesis has a method to this madness. Let's imagine a molecule with two functional groups, say an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. Now, our task is to disconnect these groups and trace back to simpler starting materials. The first step is to identify the strategic bond. The bond that, when broken, will yield the most straightforward and valuable disconnection. Think of it like a game of pickup sticks. You want to remove the stick that will cause the least disruption to the pile. In our case, the strategic bond is often between the two functional groups. But remember, this isn't always the case. Sometimes it might be more advantageous to break a bond elsewhere in the molecule, depending on the complexity of the structure and the reagents available. Once we've identified and broken our strategic bond, we're left with two simpler molecules. Now, it's a matter of figuring out how each of these molecules can be synthesized from even simpler starting materials. For example, our alcohol might be formed from the reduction of a carbonyl compound, while our carboxylic acid could be synthesized from a Grignard reagent and carbon dioxide. This process of decision-making and disconnection continues until we reach the simplest possible starting materials. But the beauty of retrosynthesis is that it doesn't just give us a roadmap to follow, it gives us several. By considering alternative disconnections and strategies, we can devise multiple synthetic routes, each with its own advantages and drawbacks. It's an elegant dance of decisions and possibilities, all aimed at creating the most efficient and effective synthesis. And that, dear viewers, is how retrosynthesis helps chemists construct complex molecules from simpler ones. So there you have it, a basic guide to retrosynthesis. We've delved into the fascinating world of reverse chemical engineering, starting from understanding what retrosynthesis really means. It's the process of deconstructing complex molecules, working backwards from product to reactant. We've explored common terms that are crucial to grasp, like target molecule and synthetic equivalent. We've navigated through the general rules and guidelines that govern this process, always keeping in mind the importance of simplicity, cost-effectiveness, and efficiency. Then we took a deep dive into the concept of disconnections, first with a single functional group and then escalating to two. These disconnections are the very essence of retrosynthesis, allowing us to break down complex structures into simpler, more manageable parts. Retrosynthesis is a mighty tool in a chemist's arsenal, one that turns the daunting task of molecule building into a manageable one. Subscribe for more because you won't find me later.